Okay, so we are now recording and this is the second of our Summer of Food and Agriculture book club discussions. So today we are going to be discussing this book, Seeds of Science, Why We Got It So Wrong on GMOs by Mark Linus. Um, I will fully admit starting out that I've not completely finished the book. I got to chapter, I think it's chapter nine, How Environmentalists Think and I did not get into that chapter, so which I which I regretted because I thought this seems like it's an important chapter to kind of close the loop on this. So uh, my comments are going to be said in ignorance of what's what's said in chapter nine and ten, just from just going to be full disclosure. Um, we'll go ahead and introduce do introductions. So <clears throat> I'm Laura Williams. I'm an assistant professor of biology at Providence College. Um, and I will hand it off to Nicole, who is right below me in the little windows. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole, and I tweet as old Dusty, and I will be starting as a sessional biology instructor at the College of New Caledonia in Prince George, British Columbia in September, and will not be teaching any courses that deal with GMOs, but I've been happy to kind of get a historical perspective from the book that we're talking about today. Excellent. Um, Megan, do you want to introduce yourself next? Uh, I'm Megan O'Sullivan. I'm a graduate student at the iSchool at the University of Madison, the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, kind of looking at decolonizing archives, decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production, um, which is, uh, is kind of connected with this book in a weird way. Yeah, I definitely think it's connected. So I'll, I'll be interested in your thoughts on that. Um, Jess, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Jessica Lowry. Um, I'm in Kelowna, BC, uh, and I work at the University of uh, British Columbia, uh, mostly with grad students um, on their writing. So. Excellent. And then Joan, do you want to, do you need me to unmute you or have you, uh, have you got it? Uh-oh. Mute. There you go. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Joan Williams. I'm retired. I'm Laura's mother. Uh, undergraduate degree in education and just general knowledge in science and find everyone's comments very interesting. And unfortunately, I didn't finish the book. Did, did, any, did anyone finish the book? I did not. Did anyone finish the book? You were all in the same boat. I just After wanted nine to comment. I mentioned this already, but I like willfully am not finishing it. I had like the time and the opportunity, but when I finished chapter eight, I was like, I'm not finishing this. I'm not, I'm, I'm in a obstinate place. <laughs> I didn't get that was, far at all. It was a not finished, Megan is a not finished out of protest, which I think you, I think that means you, you get classified as the, I did all the reading and all the homework for this. <laughs> the rest of us might be. We did not do all the reading. <laughs> I got a play-by-play -play of the uh, of Megan's not finishing because we kind of overlapped a lot on our feelings about narrative style and and where the author was kind of going. And in fact, I I think that's probably going to come out in the discussion. I I skipped chapter nine after getting two pages into it because I just couldn't handle how he was dealing with the discourse. Chapter ten is a good one though for you, Laura, if you want to have talking points about environmental impacts and mitigations from GMO. I am skipping ahead, but like that is an interesting one to take to your classroom. So we'll get there when we get there. But. Excellent. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you guys think about this. Um, so, so this book, uh, I, I'd, I'd start out by saying it's, it was, a, it's a, I, I don't really do much planning in terms of when we select the three books, kind of the order in which we, we put them. Um, but I felt like it was really interesting to follow braiding sweetgrass with this book. We kind of went from, uh, you know, indigenous knowledge and wisdom about plants and about a uh, very kind of a way of thinking about like the, the, one of the biggest things that came into my head from, from our past discussion was the plants as people idea and, and the embrace of how, you know, humans are one piece of a very broad ecosystem 
and then this is all the way on the other end of the the you know technology and and man as we will force nature to do things and and so forth so it was a it, it wasn't intentional on my part but i felt like it was a really interesting counterpoint from from where we started with the first discussions to getting here um, because this is all about genetic engineering and all about um, engineering and manipulating plants in order to increase yields, increase pesticide resistance, increase resistance to pests, things like that. Um, so it's a very different approach to- A lot of that though is indigenous knowledge as well. We kind of make this division, but it's not black and white. There is some of that knowledge in these other practices. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. So this is not a novel idea for, for the, the technology era, era, the idea. I mean, you're absolutely, Megan, that's an excellent point. So people have been dealing with pests and people have been dealing with, you know, bacterial wilt and things like that in, in agriculture for, since we've had agriculture. That's a very good point. Um, that's a good opening for me to ask. What, kind of setting aside the transition from, from, from braiding sweetgrass, but feel free to call on from that if you want to. What were your impressions of, of this, this book? I, I sense there's gonna be some strong ones. Um, does someone wanna just kind of open up with, here's what I overall thought? I'm gonna start. I mean, I, I haven't read deeply in this area, so I guess as far as, you know, starting from something other than a textbook that addresses it, I am glad that I had the opportunity to look at the book, but I guess it's also just kind of frustrating to reflect on my own episode, like experience in academia and to find out that this guy who was burning down cornfields ended up with a research fellowship, like somehow later on in his life, because, uh, you know, and I mean, it, it is me judging to be real, you know, it's, it's just interesting to see the opportunities that have been afforded this individual, but at the same time, the writing doesn't, to me, didn't reflect the depth of experience that I would have assumed that you would have gotten out of having scholarly dalliance, which I, I know this is sounding very elitist in a way, but it's just, there's, the, the book did not touch on mechanistic aspects. The book did not touch on delineations of needs for like yield mass production farming versus subsistence farming. And he addresses both, but like very descriptively. And the chapter nine, which you missed, interesting counterpoint to braiding sweetgrass in terms of him talking about his hunger for nature when he goes swimming. But it really, in a way, his attempts to be genuine about that underscores the whole thing that Robin Wall Kimmer was saying about how as a settler you cannot be indigenous to place because some of it just comes off sounding very like not rooted in a visceral understanding of ecological connectivity and it's very very conspicuous so yeah, I'm gonna leave it that's yeah. really what the narrative like for me is from this place of entitlement and this place of like a settler mindset um, on both sides He's like performative um, activism against GMOs, but he's also kind of performing for GMOs. And there's no like honesty. Maybe there's honesty inside of him, but there's not honesty in the way he's relaying the experience for me. Jess, did you have, have any kind of overall thoughts that you wanted to share? I guess in regards to the, the honesty part uh, and, and, and performance, like he seems to be in the very beginning, and I did not read very far because I kept getting kind of angry at the end of a chapter. Um, <laughs> but uh, in the first couple of chapters, he discusses all those instances of him going and burning crops. And he it appears to be that in the way that he writes, he really wants to make light of the situation and make it funny. Uh, and at first I was kind of like drawn in by this that, okay, well, I'll just like go along for the ride. And then I kind of um, started realizing that, like 
like there's no statement here of, of, of privilege as as um, Megan and Nicole kind of pointed out as well in the fact that um, in the fact that he appears to have all these opportunities. And so I think after that, that made me kind of look for things more critically, I think a little bit, a bit more. Um, so yeah, it does seem to have that um, making light of this, what is probably a very serious situation in which I'm sure a lot of people did get arrested and, and charged and, and various things, but um, that maybe is part of where the feeling like dishonesty comes from. One of my notes was definitely who can afford to be an activist. You know, um, there was this one section that was like, I was a, glo a globe trotting and going from thing to thing. And I'm like, who can afford to do this? I, I you know, it's interesting because when I was, I, I am not as well read on the topic of genetic engineering as I should be, especially considering that I teach a genomics class. Um, the genomics class tends to approach things in, in terms of a human genomics angle. So I haven't gotten as much into, you know, the genetic engineering as we think about it for, for plants. Um, we talk a little bit about CRISPR, but I haven't delved as much into genetic engineering as I would like to. So what I was pulling on for this was um, my, my college, my like high school and college. And so this is fun because my mom's on this call, so she'll, she'll know what we're talking about. I, I mean, you could have, I would never have been as radical as going in and burning crops, but I was definitely, absolutely, I'm gonna wear my t-shirt for the Earth Day and I'm gonna be like, y'all can't do genetic engineering because GMOs are bad, boo. You know, like this, this, that straight up would have been like me in college. Um, for all the reasons that he kind of states that it, it was catchy. It was like, this is what environmentalists are supposed to think. This is what it means to be green. This is, you know, and it's very, very clear that to some degree, the, I wish he'd said more about this in the part that I read, that this caught on as a result of, of what you guys are saying. It, it, it built into a movement in the UK because there were people who, from a position of privilege, like I occupied in high school and college, who wanted a cause. And they're like, this is our cause. And there was not a lot of deep thought about, okay, what are we actually critiquing? What are the actual goals and outcomes? What are we, what are we trying to accomplish? And what are the consequences of what we're trying to accomplish? Like I definitely, in college, I could, and I probably did write an essay at some point about why GMOs are bad. And I'll guarantee you, I did not think deeply about it. I just thought, no, this is, I'm an environmental person. And so I'm gonna say this is bad because that's what everybody says. Um, so reading the first, the first few chapters, I was like, oh, this is so familiar to me. <laughs> I remember this mindset. Yes, I do. Um, so that was interesting. That was interesting to kind of read it from that, that perspective. That's what hit me the most, I think. You know, well, along those lines, uh, is it Four Degrees, the book that he wrote? In that section of the book, he did say when he was making his conversion that he didn't realize how much work had been done by scientists. And then he also said that he felt bad that he got credited for that book because none of that was really his work. None of the book was his work. It was all his digging and research to find out what other scientists had done, but no scientists had put all that information together. And that seems a lot like what this, as far as I got in this book, that he's quoting a lot of other people's work and that he's not, none of it's actually his work. It's all things that he's researched and read that other people have put forward. Yeah, and I think that's a, there's definitely a role for, I mean, uh, definitely, there's, I don't think anyone would question this. There's definitely a role for skilled science writers to be able to do synthesis and, and you know, I mean, gosh, I mean, especially these days, it's becoming excruciatingly clear how important it is to have 
talented science writers who understands the material and can and can convey it and it's just a lot of i in this book which was my big thing that i kept being like i i i i i it did it did it okay this is going to be super unfair did it maybe not though did it to some degree did it feel like one of those like old school mtv reality show confessionals when he's like in the booth and he's like, okay, so let me just tell you guys what it was all like when this happens. And it totally does. Gonna... It totally did. But the thing is, maybe I got spoiled for reading Sonia Shaw's Pandemic because she curated a ton of other stuff and hooked it onto a very nice continuous narrative about different facets of cholera. Like, I think that's also uh, the part of it. We've talked so much about the assumed attitude and demeanor of the writing, but it also kind of either synergistically or falls in hand that there's a mechanical failure with him trying to present both sides of the issue. Like it actually just feels like in a booth, both sides thing, instead of actually trying to put an architecture into those chapters. And I just keep writing in my notes, what's the bias? What's the bias? Are you really unbiased enough to presenting, be presenting this information to me? I mean, it's good for me to have this, um, these names and kind of a basis of understanding, but any interpretation that he puts on it, I do not trust in any way. Did, did anybody else feel like this was, this was a book that was written more as like a personal or an exorcism of his personal demons than, it, than a <laughs> yeah. book that had, that had an actual audience in mind or like a thesis? Like to a degree, I wonder if he wrote this because I, I mean, he it's sounds not, very conflicted. And I think this book was just an exorcism for him more than anything else. It's more confession booth than MTV booth for reals. Like seriously, I mean, he spends a lot of time trying to reckon with his feelings in chapter eight and nine, where he talks about reparations with like environmentalists he used to consider friends. And like, I, I think that's the other thing is like he created the ultimate chimera of it was supposed to be a science book, but then it's this, therapy session also rolled in. Yeah, it's just this one. really weird like, memoir. Yeah. Um, this, but it's like really uncomfortable. I think that I was really uh, excited for this book. I was kind of like, I want to know like the, some of these facts, like some more information because yeah, I don't, I, I haven't been read in this, in this topic. Um, and I found that after that initial introduction to him, I was really not interested in his opinions. And it becomes hard to read when you're not interested in his story or his opinions anymore. So this is the first line of chapter eight. The process of writing this book has been unexpectedly cathartic. And that's just really, that just sums it up, right? It really, I mean, it's unfortunate that that's, that's actually the set point for balance in the book, because I think he could have, He's been floating around both circles long enough to like approach this from a more structured discussion of policy and regulatory elements and where we've gone, you know, in terms of what the science is. Asylum R got dropped once in a sentence. I thought there was going to be a bit more discourse on that instead of what ended up happening in chapter seven, I think. Because I think Siddhartha Mukherjee actually spent way more time on Asylum R in the gene and intimate history. So for the rest of you who probably, I don't know if any of you read that on this call, but it's a basically a book on the history of genes and heredity and the whole moratorium composed by Berg and why can't I remember the other guy's name? Is it Stanley Boyer? So there was like this, this conference sort of of a bunch of scientists who were working in the field of recombinant DNA technology and they were trying to come up with this document back in was it the early 80s or the late 70s? 74, 1974. 74, yeah. okay so they they had basically kind of decided as a community about this moratorium on continuing the science for a while because of not really understanding mechanistically environmental impacts, biological impacts and gene flow, which also annoyed me because Mark Linus used the term three times without really defining it. And I, I was just like, is this something I should know because I have a PhD? Or like, what are you actually talking about? That's the other, we're, we're doing a lot of trashing, but I think that's also something that's bothering me is the lack of clear definitions all up in here too. But yeah, not profiling asylum are and why that actually was 
something that scientists did that kind of does align with what activists were probably hoping for in terms of hesitation. There could have been that angle taken on it. You know, it's really interesting. I, I completely agree with you, Nicole. I feel like there's a point, and I don't remember exactly where it is, probably in chapter eight, because that's a little bit way more on the confessional side. I like I, whoever said it was like reparations, that, 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 that's a good, like he goes back to the people who he, that he feels like he abandoned. Um, I, I think in that chapter, he discusses that he drafted it and just and threw away chapters and drafted it and threw away chapters and I thought I don't know that you actually got there in the end you know like if this if this had been there there, there are uh, I don't want to be completely this, there are seeds of things there are seeds of things there are seeds of things in this book like the idea that a person could go from someone who believes they are fully justified in burning genetically engineered crops to someone who is on a national and international stage promoting genetically engineered crops, that in and of itself is interesting. I don't know that he is the right person to write that because it's, you're too close, unless you're an extraordinarily self-aware person, you're just too close to it. And so I think that would be an interesting interesting narrative or an interesting book for someone else to write about him and his circle because that is kind of fascinating to think how someone could could swing like that but there's also chapter five and six the, the two chapters that were about people in bangladesh um in in you know uganda in tanzania who are trying to deal with challenges of agriculture and trying to find ways to use this technology, those two chapters should have been an entire book that had a lot more about those people, what they were doing. Yeah, chapter six was definitely my favorite mm -hmm. chapter. Mm -hmm. And I feel, like, I feel like that would have been a, a, a good book but it probably would have needed to be written by somebody else or somebody would have needed to have a real chat with him about how to remove himself from that narrative. Cause I think he was, he was, it was still a lot of like him traveling to these, to these regions to try to kind of understand what's happening and then report back out and so forth like that. I don't um, think that he'd ever be able to escape his settler mindset, which is just something that was really clear to me. When I was reading this, um, even when he was kind of touching on some concepts of that, it was this really um, tone deaf or kind of flat um, iterations to how I understand it. It was like just kind of not even surface because surface is wrong. It's like it was akin to surface. It was like similar to how this knowledge is interpreted, but not really accurate as far as I was concerned. There was a really big missed opportunity, I think, here to kind of work with somebody and have not necessarily a more delicate framing, but actually maybe making an attempt to understand the perspective of farmers in African countries doing subsistence and the cultural context uh, through which they're viewing any interventions proposed by European or Western science versus what they need. I think, you know, that's been an interesting perspective for why public health initiatives fail or don't fail there when they're coming from international collaboration. Um, other than a lot of what he said about certain propaganda is scare tactics to discourage GMO use, which it's great that he mentioned them. He was not really the right person to write about them you know, with the sensitivity that I think it's required given the colonial histories in the nations that he chose to profile. Something else is kind of falling out of my head right now regarding that, but it was also, it related to a frustration with the lack of depth that I think chapter six potentially could have gone towards in making an independent, you know, book. Because I also, 
am kind of personally fascinated by like the breadth of viral diseases in some of those subsistence crops. Like I, I would have liked to know more about what they were doing. Number two, those farmers are subsistence farmers, which meant their perspective of actually understanding the ecosystems they work in. And when shifting a crop versus getting a GMO one would have helped them, like that would have been like an interesting way to look at how the farmers themselves view GMO fitting into their options for shifting cultivation practice. And he touches on climate change a few times, but I'm also like, yes, talk about this more because they're experiencing it firsthand in, in, in their work and in their trying to keep their families and communities alive. And I feel like he's kind of knocking at the door of some of this because there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a, a person that he spoke to, a woman who was, who, and I'm not going to, I didn't have a chance to go back and look. I think her name was Grace and I, and I think she was growing cassava, but I can't remember precisely if I'm confusing that with another farmer's individual story, but he included her as an example of someone who is suffering from not being able to use these genetic engineered crops, even the public sector ones. And then kind of towards the end of a chapter, he goes, oh, and I was back in the country a few years later and I decided I really wanted to check in on, on this, this person. And so there, he kind of describes like bumping down the road and how he's like just really terrified that he's gonna find that, you know, they've, they've starved or she's not there anymore, so forth. And he shows pictures of her that he'd taken from a couple of years ago, her and her family around. And somebody says, oh yeah, no, she's, here, she's over here. And he's like, and I was stunned because she had a completely new structure on her land and everybody looked like they were doing okay. And, and it turned out that she had started selling mangoes because her crop that she was, you know, she was struggling because it was a drought. She couldn't get them to grow. She couldn't get access to these genetically engineered you know, seeds. And so she decided she would start selling mangoes. So she diversified and made choices. And he has a moment of, of really, I mean, I think honest self-reflection where he notes that he had put her into a box as some type of helpless pawn that gets just moved around a chessboard by corporations and by Western people. And that, that was actually my favorite quote. Um, with my single-minded pursuit of a storyline that happened to fit my own interests at the time, I hadn't considered that she had multiple options and multiple ways of being resilient. And I just wrote a little note, long note on the idea of um, many ways of being resilient. Um, this kind of multiplicity or multi multiverse of like how people can be successful and then we just want to put them like you were saying in boxes and then he continues to say um, she was not just one thing waiting to be described and defined by an agent focused uh, not agent agenda focused outsider like me so he is being reflective but I also wrote um, at the beginning of this chapter is this an errant hero's journey like is he trying to map some type of like mythological like prodigal son story or something like that for himself because it just feels like there's little hints of that but that it's not successful it's stuff that you fail at escaping when you're approaching it through a colonial lens like there's so much like savioristic sentiment that also goes into him having to reflect and rescind that because you weren't thinking about and also he wasn't situated in that, in that community in a way to understand what community care and what either quieter networks or louder networks of allowing farmers to succeed and get information were. I can't remember if that mango tree was a virus resistant variety or not. I think it was. I, uh, I, my, my memory of it, it was just, it was a mango tree on her property that she- Yeah, she exactly. Like, so like, it's doing harvest that. this. Yeah, diversification for people who know what's there to diversify and is always an option. And I'm not saying that flippantly because I could not grow anything to keep myself alive to save my life. Like it's a hard profession and it does require an intuitive knowledge of where you are to grow things. Well, I think, you know, and be at mercy of what you are. 
when you are dealing with an ecosystem to generate some kind of rate of productivity, regardless of what the end economic goal is. But yeah, it's... Um, I mean, and he really frames this as some huge success of how um, flexible she was. And, and to me, it is. This, this kind of mental flexibility is a whole um, foundational concept to what I'm looking at in like indigenous ways of knowing and um, the Gullah success in the Sea Islands is this kind of um, flexibility all the time. But um, all it says is it, it earned her enough cash to buy food. It's not like she's thriving because she's selling mangoes. She's just eating. She's surviving, which is, I mean, exciting to go from not surviving to surviving but you know you want the story to be even better than that it's interesting to me because um so my husband is an anthropologist who who uh works in madagascar um and he's been going there for over 20 years now and he studies subsistence and risk and time preference and how people make decisions based on you know what the, what you know their their economic portfolio basically so there's there's people who primarily hunt and gather there's people who primarily fish and there's people who primarily do farming but the point that he always talks about is that none of these people are exclusively that that they're very conscious of the need to have a diversified portfolio of of economic you know how to get your food what you'd want to sell at market how much you want to sell you know what you need to invest in how you need to i mean he said they, they know what they're doing they know how to do all of this they know that they have many different resources and many different ways of trying to utilize those resources uh, but one of the things he talks about is when you get ngos that come in and they're singularly focused on this one thing and they're like this one thing that is also the same thing that 27 other places around the world need we're going to give that to you it's like that doesn't even make it's sense kind of like a um, monoculturing of the mind right it's like yeah. this singular idea that we not we meet you and i but a person or group of people go out into the world and be like this is the thing that is going to fix or save or whatever it is oh i like the monoculture of the mind that's good um Jess, you I know you said you didn't get very far into it, but I just thought, do you have any thoughts you want to? I was just, um, yeah, I was, I was very happy listening in on this because that sounds like that might be a chapter that I, I think I need to jump ahead and just take a look at uh, for sure. Yeah, I would say, I would say, I think it was five and six. Was it, is that, is that five right? Is, five is um, India and agriculture um, and six is Africa. And I mean, they're both good. They're, they're the high points of the book. They are not great though, you know, but if you're going to, if you have the book already, sure. They're, they're, they're the, they're, yeah, those, that, and I think I already said this, so I'm repeating myself, but the five and six are the, are the core of what could be a really, a really excellent book on the perspectives of, of, of people who want to use this, this technology, but who are being blocked from using this technology because of political motivations from people who are outside of their, their communities, which has a, a lot in there. Um, just, the, just the bits that, he, I mean, there's so many things you could blow up into whole chapters of books. The, um, I think it was Uganda that had a biosafety law that, that, that was just lots of lobbying from outside um, organizations trying to kind of get them to pass this legislation and, and prevent all these things from happening. And the frustration of these scientists who are, I don't, there's, I don't know if uh, Megan and Nicole, you got to this, mom, I don't know if you got to this too, but um, there's a part where they're talking about uh, um, genetically engineered maize. And they were, they were finally allowed to do an, an open field trial 
which was a big, big deal because up, up to a certain point, they had not even been allowed to do open field trials. They had to all be contained in greenhouses because they were concerned about you know, pollen getting things spreading on the wind and so forth. And so they'd done an open field trial and they were really excited about the results. And it was, I think, I think it was, yeah, it was maize. And they were really pleased. And then they basically had to harvest all of it and burn it. Yeah, and like down the road, there's people who are who are really struggling with food insecurity, and they're like, they're just they're just burning all of this maize that could could very well be used by people. And I and I thought to myself because I'm finding myself very frustrated on the COVID front, um, and I thought to myself, well, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine if you're a scientist, and you, you know you've grown up in a country that for a lot of reasons that are some internal and some external, you know that you're, 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 the people in your nation are struggling and they're struggling heavily with food insecurity and you've devoted yourself to trying to find ways to solve this problem. You've successfully solved this problem <laughs> and now you've got to burn it because some group in the UK was like, no, you shouldn't be able to do this. Like, ah. Uh. That would be that would be deeply, deeply frustrating. Bye. I, I, I think I oh Nicole, go yeah, well, no, no, Nicole, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, as a child, I think I was much more flippant about the value of food and like that did kind of trigger an emotional response in me reading that because it's just we uh, set up whatever economic system we're in it's just not allowing people to live well in their environments and i don't mean live well by the standards that we call living well but like there's the like, sociologist in me yeah. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a functional sociologist that just says that that's by design you know people on top want to stay on top one of my issues with um G GMOs um, has nothing to do with genetic engineering. It has nothing to do with all of these other concerns. It just has to do with big business. What is big business and monopolies? How do those change how the world looks? And part of what this is talking about is how activism is also its own kind of big business. Yeah, that's true. That's a really good point. Well, Megan, uh, what you're saying too, like in that chapter about the background of Monsanto, the whole reason that they got into biotechnology was so they could figure out how they could make an income stream and monetize it. So, you know, and then the other things came later, like, oh, yes, well, you know, greener, less pesticide, but they were looking for an income flow. And it's like the people that have the money they keep the money. So it's, yes, not, not particularly right or fair, but it's, you know, what can be done about that as a sociologist? It's, you know, theories need to be put forward. Yeah. And, you, and you're looking to it and, and, you know, and I, so I read chapter eight, um, and I did, it didn't, I wish it had been, and I haven't read chapter nine, but um, chapter eight, I thought, I thought we were going to get into, because if I, let me look at the title of it. It said, what anti-GMO activists got right. And so I thought, okay, here we go. We're going to hear like where they're all coming from. And we kind of got that, but as we've already, it was all kind of like, I don't know, snarky is not the right word, but it's all I can think of kind of weird. I still can't figure out what they got right. I read that and it was like also three in the morning. So I'm just like, this is a fever dream to me. It's, it's lots of words and yeah. But that's almost how he wrote it. It was like, I'm just going to throw these words up there and I'm not really going to um, analyze it. I'm going to let you pick and choose what you think they got right out of this. Um, and that's part of when I felt like he was talking around some of these um, colonization, decolonization terms and thoughts, but not 
about them. Yeah, I think I feel like there was a lot of transcription of, of interviews that he did with people. And I don't know if he didn't trust himself. I, I partially wonder if he decided because he, he made it clear that, that these, these folks were people, there was a lot of personal angst involved in him talking to these people because these were people who remained on the anti-GMO side that he had been friends with and in some cases had, had broken with and what, what, you know, what, what I will acknowledge sounded like deeply painful and deeply personal ways. Um, so to me, that's another, that, that, that kind of maybe was its own book. Um, because I, I, I could see that. I could see how that would be a, that would be a difficult experience to be going on this, this personal journey about where your beliefs are and where your, your, your thinking is on a big topic like this and find yourself deviating from people who you counted as very, very close friends. I mean, I think he said one of these people, they'd been the best man at each other's weddings. And now they, I mean, I think he was the same person that he said later in the chapter, kind of, I grew to despise this person. And so that's, that's a significant journey. But I, I wonder if he didn't trust himself to, to not uh, frame their words in a way they didn't intend. Or, and so I wonder if he just transcribed entire chunks of these because he said, I just don't even want to touch this. I, just I think don't that's even giving wanna... him way more integrity and credit than I am willing to give him. And you're welcome to give that to him. I'm not going to give that to him. I felt Noted. like he felt like this needed to be in here so he could check a box and he's mm -hmm. like incapable of interpreting it without his bias. Therefore, he does not interpret it. Or when he does, it's very like, um, he's talking about Shiva and he's like, she may have a point here, but, and the, she may have a point. She may have a point five words, but a lot of more words than five. True. That's very true. Uh, Has anyone read anything by her? I have not. Have you? I have not. Um, I've heard of her before. And, I, and I also definitely not heard of her. Good terms, um, but. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of what I was wondering is, um, what, what, just, what he quotes of her here is really interesting because um, she's talking about how um, Western science is merely a local tradition that has been spread worldwide through intellectual colonization, which is what I'm looking at, like kind of as my summer project, this uh, idea of expansion of empire through botany. And um, I just remember that when I went to the Heirloom Expo in... 2016, I think it was. Um, she was supposed to be the like keynote speaker. And um, this is put on um, by a seed company, Baker Creek. And they uninvited her because she was talking about um, that every GMO field should be burned. And it was just this really interesting, she went from being this complete um, savior figure in the organic world to being kind of blacklisted overnight. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, it, it, I know as much of her as I, as I had mentioned, I kind of knew her name and I knew that people did not agree with her. So it was, it was, her name was kind of already associated with, um, you know, this person is not correct or this person is, is from what I understand, kind of out I think there. that she's very, hyperbolic, um, but I don't think that this book escapes any of that hyperbolism on the other side either. So um, even though people don't take her seriously, I'm not sure why this guy should be taken seriously either. I feel like the problem, well, there's lots of problems, but there's another problem with chapter eight, and that's that I can't remember if this was the chapter that was preceded by almost a sub-biography of Jeremy Rifkin, which I also found frustrating because I'm like, why did you spend so much time on this dude who basically 
just sounds like a charismatic person who just said a lot of things persuasively to make people think GMO is bad. But like on that theme of intellectual colonization, you can't talk about the anti-GMO movement without talking about highly penetrative, charismatic messages that do not actually mechanistically and critically evaluate GMO and the amount of money put behind intellectually colonizing people forcefully to like mobilize them around one polarized like you can't the, the only part that he shows about what the gmo movement got right is the capacity to organize and like that's not a good selling point really what do you think about you know trying to to state it within the topic of gmo it's just more like what was the social penetrance and how did they manage to be persuasive? That's actually not even touching the subject matter. I mean, that's kind of my view of it. So it's a good playbook on how you get connected, although you're seeing all the connections after the fact, but like maybe that's the reason he had to blubber around his own words and guilt is to realize that maybe there wasn't a good anchor for him philosophically, other than the fact that there was a lot of fervency in a lot of ways to like spread it around with whatever mechanisms they chose i don't know i i wish there had been because i this chapter chapter eight ends up as a tech it ends up as a critique of technology which is which is an entirely separate thing than talking about genetic engineering and how it gets deployed i noticed and, that too i noticed that kind of the 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 movement towards technology is what when i was saying that talk about kind of an indigenous knowledge but he's not talking about it here he's talking about it over here in the terms of tech and, and framing it under technology and it gets kind of um confusing yeah i i agree i mean people th there is there you know there are valid and 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 interesting and thoughtful critiques of technology in general. Um, but, but this chapter ended up talking about typewriters and computers. And I was like, okay, I get that. And that touches on this, but, but really this should be about what is it about genetic engineering and that, that particular application of technology that, that is so loathsome to these people because, because, at least in this chapter, and I don't know what, what happens in chapter nine, I admit, that we don't even, he doesn't even touch on kind of what you might consider the moral implications of things, like the complaint, the things that the problems that people have with CRISPR, that's technology too, right? And there's some concern that you're getting into, you know, um, there's a lot of things to say where people would say, oh, wouldn't it be so great and we can use CRISPR and then you won't have autism anymore. And then you have advocates within the autism community who are like, what are you talking about? Like, we're perfectly fine people. We're happy people. We're good people. We're people who belong in society and make society richer. You can't just get rid of us. Um, but I feel like there's, there's, there was an opening here to talk about kind of what Megan was saying, which is, this particular technology with genetic engineering and agricultural production and crop production is a situates itself in corporations, how corporations control people's ability to, to provide for themselves, how corporations from outside of countries can then become deeply enmeshed in that country's survival, that country's economic ability, that country's growth. What does that mean? I mean, there are some legitimate, serious criticisms of all of that that I felt like just you just went bing, just and kind of right off the of surface. Monoculturing, you know, like the idea of Roundup Ready um, technology kind of freaks me out in terms of um, monocropping and biodiversity. And um, I just looked up biodiversity in my ebook version of the. Um, the text and he only mentions it like between six and eight times and it's always in passing. So that's like a real concern of mine is what, is what does this look like when you're spraying 
these safe chemicals all over everything. What does that mean for biodiversity? Hmm. I think he also missed an opportunity to talk about those examples where apparently using Roundup Ready was minimizing the need to do tillage agriculture, which is actually related. Like for somebody who actually ended up in the academic field to, to do agronomy and not talk about till versus no till, which is still a big land management kind of aspect, I that kind of could have made it in here. I mean, I really do feel like I'm relentlessly trashing at this point on things that are minor, but like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I kind of feel like if you're in the field and he probably should know more than I did with my one and a half years in ag tech, I just kind of feel like that's a thing that should be addressed. Jess, did you want to talk about Chilton and Montague? Because we had a brief- Oh, yeah, we had a whole whole talk about that. Um, I actually do have to run in like a minute here though, because I have a, a couple of meetings coming up, but um, I, for that chapter, I kind of felt like he really talked about Montague a lot at the very beginning with the whole biography of like his entire life story in a few pages. And then I looked up Chilton later and I feel like she is more of a role or at least as much of a role as he does. Um, and anyways, he gave her, first he introduced her as in plight and then he gave her like a paragraph. So I was feeling like there was maybe some um, biases there and I was a little uncomfortable with it. But anyways, that was my <laughs> two cents. Well, she actually did the experiment, right? I mean, yeah, I published the paper, yeah. I'd entirely, I mean, in all of our discussion just now, I'd entirely forgotten about that chapter where there was us. <laughs> Thank you for going back to that. I'd completely forgotten about it. Yeah. Um, I, I, Jess, I know you said you had to go, which I totally understand. Um, lots of meetings. And then we're Thanks also- Thanks so much for all the chats and, and yeah, that was great. Yeah. No, thank you for being here. Um, and so we're also approaching three. So I want to, I want to respect people's times. Um, do you got closing thoughts? Do people have closing thoughts? I have thoughts for anyone who's watching this on YouTube, which is if you have the book, read chapters five and six. There's also some okay stuff in like three and possibly 10. If you don't have the book, don't buy it. I like that was a good like, there you go. Um, Nicole, Joan, do you guys have any closing thoughts? I'm fully on the chapter five, six, 10 team up in here too. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is one that will be sitting on my shelf, although it's in like Kindle archive. Um, but I think there's a, like a couple of like the numbers dropped in chapter 10 could be an interesting way of like talking about land use impacts again with GMO, as well as some of the other things that happened in chapter six, which we really don't talk enough about. There is a little bit of like um, ability to resource mine out of this, like, oh, I didn't know about that. Now I can go check that out. I will not be referring to this book, you know, quoting out of this book, but I might be finding other things because of this book. Um, and there is something to be said about how things you don't like can be very generative in your own work to kind of want to respond to them, to want to counteract them, to want to reply to them. To want to learn more about what they're talking about because they didn't present enough information for you. Yeah. Right. Or you want to argue with them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mom, or, Joan, mom. Do you want to? Yes. <laughs> do you want to? Do you have any other closing, no, closing thoughts? I didn't. I didn't read enough of the book, but I think everybody's comments were very interesting. That it was probably like surface, but he is at least. I found him to be a writer that I could read. Um, you know, he may be a touching on the surface, but he. Um, he wasn't difficult to read once I got into it. I did think the very first chapter about all that crop stuff and everything, I had a hard time getting through that and getting on. Mm -hmm. So, but I'll have to see, uh, I'll have to tackle the book for next month first, and then maybe I'll go back and see if I can finish this one. But that's my contribution. That's a good one. Um, 
I think for me, I think my biggest conclusion of this is, uh, I, I'm glad, I cannot, I cannot now remember who suggested it. Um, I'm grateful for the person who suggested it because, I, because it, it got me thinking, oh yeah, I should really come back to this topic because when I was in college, I had formed opinions on this that were not, that were not deeply considered and I had not kept those opinions as I went on, but I hadn't really formed any other knowledge about it. I just said, oh, I probably was just knee-jerk reaction to that. And then I kind of, this entire topic of genetic engineering has, has apart from the, when we think about CRISPR in my classes, I haven't, I haven't really gone in and dug into it as much as I, as I would like to, and I would like to be able to do so that it's something we can talk about with my students. So this prompted me to think, aha, yes, there is a lot, just like, you know, Megan said, there's a lot to go find that this book is not providing, but that has, I thought, oh yes, okay, now we need to get into this. The other thing I'm going to say is it's so very clear that there are, this is cruel, it's so very clear that there are pieces of much better books in this book. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm be particularly eager to see a, a very skilled science writer take the, the core of chapters five and six and really produce something wonderful from that. Um, and I know there's people who can do it. Maybe somebody has, and I just don't know about it. Um, but, but yeah, I would be glad to read something from a, from, from a, a talented science writer who could kind of talk more about the content that was covered in chapters five and six, because I think that's valuable and, and really essential to this conversation. Those are my thoughts. One of my other things that I might say in defense of this book, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but um, we brought it up last time, which is if this had an audio book and I could approach it more passively, I might have enjoyed it more. Um, it's kind of like a, like a podcast or something that you could just take in at a different level. I would be okay with it, but sitting down and reading it with my pen in my hand, it just didn't hold up the same way. Right there with you, Megan. I much prefer an audio book. I do much better with those. I was thinking that when, when Megan was saying that, I was thinking that Joan is going to be definitely on board with that. But that's it. But Megan, that's interesting because it's the idea that that it's if you're going to if you're going to sit down to read a book in, in, in text, you, you want you want it to be substantial. You don't want it to just kind of skate off the, you know. Yeah, that's that's an interesting perspective. Well, thank you, folks. This was really always a joy. It's always a bright spot in my week on a Monday to, uh, to get to talk about books. Um, so I really, really appreciate people taking time, not only to read it, but also to, uh, to discuss it. So thank you for that. Um, we are in August, date, time to be determined. We'll be reading our third book, which is The Botany of Desire. And I have never read this book, even though it has been around for a while. Um, I think it was. And it has an audiobook. Yay! Excellent audiobook. Mom, do you have the audiobook? Yes? No? No, no I do not. But you I, can get it. Course, I don't know. I have it from the library, and I do Hoopla and Libby from the library. I didn't see it on there. So, Megan, it's available through where? I have my, my copy from Audible. I've had it for a super long time. I'll look into it a little bit more. Audible. Okay. All right, thank you. Follow up if, if I need to. Um, I have also not read it. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to see how next month will go. Yeah, because I, I think it's early 2000s. Is that true? I think it's been around for a while. So, um, but I, I've, I've heard it mentioned by people many, many times. So um, this will be, be my chance to read it, which I'm looking forward to. All right, folks, with that, uh, we will close. That's just about an hour. And again, um, thank you so much. This is always wonderful. It's always so nice part of summer. So um, I really appreciate you folks joining. And then hopefully we will see you in August for our third book. <laughs>